All right, what did we have going back? We have some questions. Um, so we try to be a little contentious. Uh, since this is the, pri the topic of this entire event was zero knowledge and privacy, we thought we'd dig a little into privacy and see if anyone here has some opinions and if anyone out there has some opinions on, uh, and this is a classic, I wonder if this will work. Why would you want privacy if you have nothing to hide? <laughs> you know, terrorist. Th this uh, dataist view of uh, all information wanting to be free and out in the world is uh, not by any means to be condemned and is probably something we all share to some degree. But I think we probably also can relate to the reality that uh, different ideas, uh, perhaps more uh, radical or, or um, curious ideas emerge in the presence of privacy. So that it's not that, uh, I, I, I don't know anybody that, that, that wants, for example, um, important and compelling data that needs to be private today to still be private in 10,000 years when it is uh, uh, the subject of compelling anthropological research. Uh, but we know that uh, good ideas take time to incubate, and they take time to incubate in private. And if there's a sense that the state is watching uh, or that uh, corporations who have uh, contrary interests to our own are watching, uh, then I think we know that our perhaps playfulness and, and childlike uh, wonder that accompanies some wonderful ideas uh, might be stifled during that time. So I think privacy is important during the period when ideas incubate and grow to become great. So uh, I, I really can't relate to the question at all. Like, I have so many things to hide. Um, <laughs> like, uh, okay, can I ask a follow-up then? So at what point is it not, like, think that's, that's a, you sort of define, like, there's a time where things need to be private and then there's a time where they aren't. What defines that and who defines that? So for me, a lot of this is how I present myself within different social groups. Um, we're, we're here and like we're a bunch of crypto people talking about crypto and privacy and nobody needs to know uh, about any hypothetical irregular birthmark on my back, right? <laughs> like it, it's just not- But what if we wanna know? It's not important or relevant to my identity as a human being within this particular group. And uh, a lot of things that I present to the group are not important to my family. They don't really care about ZK snarks or Bitcoin or things like that. Um, privacy is a lot about controlling the information that we share with groups, right? Um, I project an identity. I'm a pretty cool guy named James. And, uh, you know, I want to be able to curate my identity even when you know, it's relatively innocuous things. I want to be able to control what you know about me because I'm trying to present an image to you. Uh, so I think my view on this is pretty similar to psychedelic Mark Hamill here. Um, <laughs> where, like, I think that that saying you have nothing to hide. <laughs> I'm sorry. Justin? <laughs> That's good. Oh, yeah, psychedelic Zach Gallif Ganakis is good as well. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think my view is pretty similar to yours, Justin. Uh, that I think that like saying that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear is a very utopian view. If you have if you have nothing to hide, you can still absolutely have things to fear. I mean, like, um, in the if you live in like I don't know some small, very conservative uh, town, you probably don't want to come out uh, about the fact that you're trans, for example. Um, not because being trans is wrong, not because you want to hide this fact from, from people who might accept it, but because you uh, might suffer the threat of violence. Um, but, and then, uh, of course, at the state level, I mean, I think probably in this conference more than any, I think a lot of people would say that many uh, Ill currently illegal drugs, like there's nothing immoral about taking them, for example, but you may suffer uh, state violence as a result of taking them, like uh, police raids on your home, etc. And this is actually like a, a real world use case of, of, of privacy and cryptography is paying for illegal drugs. Um, I'm gonna cut you off at some point. Yeah, I think, I think I've basically <laughs> like made my point. 
Okay. I can just keep ranting okay. if you like. You got it. You didn't answer, so. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll take this in a little bit of a different direction. Uh, so I think that right now the world is marked by this profound loss of control over your own private data, and that I'm not entirely certain that it's possible for any person in, in a practical sense to keep information about themselves private in 2018, and that I only see that getting worse and worse going forward. So I think in a number of small use cases like cryptocurrency maybe, due to the efforts of people in this room, will have an ability to pay for drugs that are private. But all the other details that surround that aren't going to be something where you can ensure that other people don't find out. So I, I kind of wonder whether privacy is this moment in time, moment in history rather, where we are currently living at the end of it and that going forward, there just isn't any left. Um, so I think that like really, like, so for instance, talk about DNA data. Everybody's really concerned about their, uh, their DNA becoming public or getting abused by other firms. Um, but even if you're not submitting that information to say a 23andMe or an Ancestry.com, there's still routine medical procedures that everybody goes through and there are healthcare providers that aggregate that information and it's only a matter of time until enough of them get breached that everybody's DNA data is public on the internet all of the time. And you can't go back from that. Mm. So what do you do? You have to start designing systems or making regulations and laws that deal with a future where most of the information is public about most of the people all the time. Whoa. So uh, that's my take on that. Nice. <laughs> oh, you wanna take this guy? All right, audience questions. Who has a question? Or a comment? Or an opinion. <laughs> Fight me. It doesn't have to be on this topic. It can be any question. How can this current state of cryptocurrency security be reasonably more secure than it is today? How can, how can cryptocurrency security be more secure than it is today? Um, so I think that a lot of the tools that we're building with are first generation. There's somebody's rough cut of what a compiler looks like to build a smart contract. There's somebody's rough cut of what uh, you know, software looks like to build a blockchain. And I haven't seen a whole lot of really serious study about things beyond just the consensus algorithms that we use to you know, negotiate uh, consensus across a, a, a giant distributed protocol. I think that there's a huge amount of room to gain for my topic, you know, I'm particularly interested in smart contract security, of just let's take another take at building a compiler on top of reasonable components like LLVM and instead of come up with our own bytecode language, use something that already exists that's fit for the purpose. Uh, so that unfortunately takes a lot of effort and there's inertia in the community to stick with what we've got. But every other field rediscovers a new language every year, whether it's Go, Swift, Rust, or TypeScript, or, and everybody creates new crates and new libraries for those things quite rapidly. I don't feel like we should tie ourselves down and refuse to be nimble and break with the past to get something better in the future. I think that's the main thing that holds people back. So uh, a lot of other fields do iterate quite rapidly, but cryptography and other high security applications iterate very slowly. We've had OpenSSL as a standard for quite a long time, and you've seen like NACL, LibSodium based stuff coming up, but overall like cryptography and high impact applications move pretty slow. I don't know if we want blockchains to be rapidly iterating. Uh, sure, so I think you could split that in two halves. I do agree with you on the cryptography part. Take slow, consistent steps forward and verify appropriately. I think there's other parts of it that you can break down. Like, I would love to just rewrite the Solidity compiler from scratch, and I know I could do it, and it would be fine. Um, but you like, heard it here, folks. yeah, no, <laughs> I, like it, it. It's not a high assurance piece of code, and you have reusable, reliable underlying components that you can build with. Um, you know, the, the LVM team has done some amazing things with it. Uh, so yes, I think you're in a different position when you talk about like how do we deploy zk Starks on a broad scale or how do we you know more efficiently build them. You probably don't want to dive into it. Uh, oh wait, wait. Before we, you, I think there's some other people that need to answer. So yeah, I think your point about research is, is quite good. Like there, I think there is quite a lot of research in the sort of privacy and uh, zero knowledge proofs. I mean, that's what a lot of the talks here have been about uh, for good reason. True, I mean, the, uh, well, the, the Zcash and uh, 
I'd say mostly the Zcash team has is, is, been doing a lot of really good work uh, implementing sort of a lot of the ideas that have been coming out of it. Um, but yeah, I think that like a lot of the privacy tech is sort of like vaguely floating around in the research space without like a good solid implementation. But like the same was true of, of Bitcoin. Like the, the, the components of Bitcoin were floating around for a long time, um, sort of uh, blockchains and proof of work um, and, and, and this kind of, and like applying that to currency. These things all, all existed before Bitcoin, but they needed a practical implementation before they took off. And I think uh, the same is true for a lot of the privacy tech that we have. Um, where like these these ideas have been floating around for a while with like some amount of uh, of, of smaller scale implementations, but it's going to take like some uh, implementation effort to like, really take off. And I don't know, maybe Zcash is that. I don't have any association with the Zcash team, so I can't tell you. But um, some Zcash is here. I mean, okay, how do we make essentially the security aspects of cryptocurrency more secure? I think if anybody tells you they know the answer, they're probably trying to sell you something. Uh, I think there's one thing, though, that uh, I think is pretty obvious. We could start all treating each other like uh, adult citizens of the Internet. One thing adults are allowed to do is sign contracts. I don't know who else is with me, but I think that if you want to sign arbitrary bytes with your Ethereum key pair, there needs to be tooling for that. I think it's ridiculous that that still does not exist. <laughs> all right. Questions? I an opinion uh, on that question, I think we should have a lot of huge bounties. So, for example, if you find a, maybe we should do this, I think, uh, if you find a way to forge Zcash, uh, you know, like a hundred, and you disclose it to us, $100,000 prize or $200,000 prize. And I think uh, there should be a lot of stuff like that. All right, you just made an opinion, friend. <laughs> What, who do we knock off? Damn. Okay. <laughs> go, go down the line. <laughs> so that was an opinion. Do we go for another question then? Well, we get the other panelists' response to that opinion. Uh-oh, there's an opinion we're go this way, right? festering, right? Sure. Um, uh, I, I agree somewhat with the idea that bug bounties are really important, especially in uh, the sort of high-reliability world of crypto. I think... Um, so I work with Parity, and we'll be trying to have some amount of We could of tell from bounties. your shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 this isn't a minimal techno label. This is, no, uh, a, uh, this is a blockchain company. Uh, it <laughs> might be quite hard to tell that. Um, but I, I, I don't actually... Sorry? <laughs> keep, keep, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a little bit of it. I don't know. You have to ask someone who actually knows about the Parity Ethereum client. But uh, so... Um, I don't know how much feedback we've had from the from the uh, bug bounty. Does uh, is there any other parity people who know more about it here? Almost none. Almost none. Right. Exactly. Um, I think that just the fact that it's not established uh, is is like there's, there there aren't that many bug bounties in the crypto world. I think already that's one problem. Um, plus the fact that like the bounties for forging, for example, Zcash. Are so in uh, like immensely high um, that that the, the, there's very little bug bounty that any one party could give that would uh, uh, counteract that. And I think like Apple's having the same problem where like the 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 cost the, so the um, amount of money you could get from creating a bug uh, for, for for finding a bug in like the kernel of of, of Mac of, of Mac OS. Is, is so high that wow. there's very little they can do to actually create a bug bounty that, that offsets that cost. Cool. I don't know. Bug bounties seem to me, I, I mean, although it's hard to argue with the reality that they sometimes work well, uh, they seem to me to be kind of stuck in the old orthodox financial notion uh, that exactly one person is responsible for compelling change in the world. And we know... I, I, you know, if you work in software at all, or I imagine if you uh, were invent in any space, uh, you know that typically when there's a good idea, uh, there are several parties that contemporaneously come up with that same idea around the world. Uh, and so I think for bounties to be meaningful, uh, they need to transition to some way, which I've not yet been able to imagine, uh, that rewards contemporaneous invention by uh, disconnected parties, you know, independent parties around the world in different languages and in different cultures, and you know. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you, but um, I was thinking along the same lines of him, is 
if I have a bug that lets me forge Zcash, um, I can over time just withdraw up to all the shielded you know, Zcash ever with nobody noticing. So it'll set me up for a few decades, probably. Um, if, if you can put together like a $10 million bug bounty, uh, I, I would seriously consider it, though. Cool. We need a question. So I actually had an opinion on this, if that's okay. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, All right. So um, I work at the Ethereum Foundation, and right now we're ramping up our uh, bounties program, not within the foundation itself, but within the ecosystem with people like the Bounties Network and... Um, I think Honey is another name for one. But basically, we have things like our testing team has one tester right now because a few of them had to leave. So we put up a bounty for people to make a you know, client consensus test, et cetera, and people are flocking to it. Uh, it's actually working out. So when you're talking about bug bounties for individual things within a project, it actually is seeming to work so far as long as you incentivize it correctly and you make it properly like pseudonymous. Uh, for bounties for like major client bugs and things like that, that is much more difficult. I agree with you guys. Cool. You're uh, you're off. Sorry. Farewell, friends. Welcome. You can you can always come back on if you have uh, some other opinions. Do you guys want to talk about that? Or you can also just pass. So. <laughs> I, I think that this is a pretty delicate balancing act because with, if you can fake snarks, obviously there's not enough money out there to incentivize revealing that bug. Um, when we're talking about testing, it's all like really low value, very basic you know, consensus tests. It's a lot of uh, what programmers would consider grunt work. Um, but then uh, I think that's a really good use case. The other like end of the spectrum that is also bad is like the Filecoin bounties. They put a hundred thousand dollar bounty on a major cryptographic problem that would require a grad student researcher several months to solve. And for Filecoin, who has hundreds of millions and is asking for mission critical uh, software, mission critical cryptographic structures, um, well, the the space is trying to underpay researchers and engineers pretty drastically. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for bounties, but uh, we need to re-examine how we approach them. And I'm glad to hear that the Ethereum Foundation is having success. So I think what you were saying that you had a success with the sort of lower level writing tests and what you were talking about with the Filecoin bounties, I think they're more like implementation bounties where there's sort of like, they know what work needs to be done. They can measure the amount of, uh, they, they, they can estimate the amount of time that would take and they can sort of estimate the amount of money that that would translate to. I think that's quite separate to a bug bounty of if you find a bug, you can get this amount of money, which are a lot, they are a lot harder to sort of estimate the, the, the correct sort of financial incentives there because you don't know what the bug is really. I mean, you can tell, you can, you can price it per area of bug, um, but even the impact, like you can only get so coarse grained. Um, I think that maybe the implementation bugs are like a lot, uh, simpler and saying that something works as implementation uh, as an implementation bounty maybe doesn't necessarily translate to success for bug bounties. Oh, yeah, I just want to add in terms of purely financial gain, you, yeah, you couldn't make a bounty high enough that it would, would be better than exploiting a, a forgery uh, bug. But I'm guessing typically it, it will be like a person who's at least kind of a, a good person, but has also some temptation. <laughs> <laughs> In such a case, I think, okay, maybe it shouldn't be a high, maybe 200,000, 300,000, you know, it should be high enough that for a reasonably moral person who's not an angel, he would prefer <laughs> that path than to exploit the forgery. Okay, questions. Let's see the hands. Give some new people a chance. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, even if you would gain like 10 million from exploiting the bug, then that 10 million in your life as a real world person would be very difficult to cash out and it would be very difficult to wander that That's money. An, that's an opinion. So it would be better to report it to a bug bounty that would give you at least, let's say, 
500,000 or maybe 1 million. I mean, there is that notion of dirty money and how do you value dirty money versus clean money, right? Hmm. Opinion. Yeah. Okay. James. Oh, you're up. You always come back up. Oh, so many bottles. <laughs> this is what happens when you introduce beer. Now you, now you can't say it yet. I'm sorry. I know it's hard. <laughs> All right. Uh, other thoughts on this comment? So never discount altruism. There's a lot of people in this room who could break a lot of shit and then we'll fix it without getting any bug bounty. So there's a lot of good people in the world. However, that's super optimistic and there are people who would steal as well. Uh, so for those people, it's not always dirty money. In fact, I'm not super technical, but can someone confirm that like if, the, if a bug was found in Zcash and they were to exploit it, they could get away without people knowing the coins were minted. Is that correct? For the most part? Right. Okay, so yeah. If that happens, then we're screwed. So, yeah. No, but I think another question, is it clear that it would be illegal? Say you, you find some, the, something in the code that enables you to forge a, a trillion dollars. Is it clear that there's any law against it? You know. do, you have, do you have an opinion there? I do. Oh, oh, you, okay. There's a oh. question that comes up. So he's voiced his opinion. You okay. voice in, and then we have another question. I don't think you could make, there's very few arguments you can make that that would be illegal, right? Like it's, the, the crypto space is still pretty unregulated even though ICOs have had some attention recently. Um, and like security by sending the police to your door is not a very uh, reliable or, or trustworthy form of security. Like just saying that something is secure because it would be illegal to, 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 to break the security is, is not very convincing and, and does not inspire trust. Because, um, you know, it's, it, it's security that can be defeated by a crazy man with a big gun. Uh, <laughs> or, or at least, um, yeah, whatever. Okay, hey. uh, questions? So for bug bounties, I feel like there's two really important questions to get everybody on the same page that need to get answered. The first one you hinted at, which is, do you think that a bug bounty being available changes someone's behavior from bad to good. And then the second is, do you think that bugs in, say, cryptocurrency clients are sparse or dense? Because I think that whether they are sparse or dense <laughs> determines a strategy for bug bounties being effective or not. He, he almost had a question. No, well, do we no, give it to him? What do, we, what do we say? Don't put me up there. You, get, you, did, you did. You did. I'm, you, I'm leading the witness. What is it? Yeah. Frederick? <laughs> I'm, I need a... You're the jury. What do I what do? I do? My, my vote is for that. It's a question. Opinion. All right, you're up. Oh. Can I answer it, though? <laughs> Here. Here. I'll take it. Oh, yeah, please. There's also there's a bounty for finding a bug in the protocol here of people exchanging. Yeah. So regarding if bugs are dense or sparse, um, and I maybe didn't understand your question entirely accurately, I guess the way you phrased it, but um, for Ethereum, we have a fuzz tester, and that finds bugs a lot. That found like nine consensus critical bugs within a week of our release period, right before we released a, a, hard, a hard fork like breaking change. So I would feel like they're pretty sparse in that regard, but then the ones that are extra like hard to find and you can't find by a fuzzer, those would be deep, I guess. Yeah. That's how I think about it at I least. No, no, wait, it's not your turn. And actually you don't get to answer your own question. No, no, you don't, you don't, it's you. It's me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I really don't want to offend anyone. I am. <laughs> Um, no, I, I mean the, the, the team at Go Ethereum is amazing, um, but looking at that code for a few hours, no, I, I, you know where this is going. So <laughs> I, I would be concerned that there is both a lot of sparse bugs and dense bugs, but I, I would say that people in the space don't have the time to dig around. Um, maybe people who really, really like Bitcoin will have some incentive to exploit that, but I don't know. We've hopefully hired those people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think you've weighed in on this. Yeah, I, do, you, 
Do you, what was the question again? Do you want to just repeat the two? Uh, so the two questions were, do you believe that a bug bounty being available can change someone's behavior from bad to good? And then the second was, do you believe that it's effective to run a bug bounty where bugs are either sparse or bugs are dense? So the sparse for, for de versus dense, I, I have no idea. Uh, I, yeah, I think a bounty can change people's behavior. I see it in myself in cases where I'm like, I have a plastic bottle in my hand, well, and... This is from an attacker, someone who's like a black hat. Someone I, who steals money. He's gonna let him Well, finish. people, uh, right, the, say the person who found uh, the bug is kind of a, a random uh, person. I, for, a, you know, a super, the extreme black hat, or maybe it wouldn't change. I'm saying for, for me, for example, uh, the, uh, the example I want to give, say I'm holding a plastic bottle, if the recycling can is right, right there, I will recycle it. If I need to walk around with this bottle for 15 minutes before finding there, there's some threshold where I, I won't do the good thing. That's how I, I experience this in, with myself with stuff all the time. And uh, so given that the person who will find the bug will be kind of a random person, not extreme to one, I think yes, uh, the bounties can change behavior from uh, bad to good. Have the three of you guys answered? Yes. Okay. I oh, just a second. Okay. So I want to see questions. Put up hands. All hands. All hands. Oh, oh. There's one there. I mean, uh, when you have a lot of these, I guess what you would call sparse bugs, uh, it depends how much work a researcher has put into finding that bug. Because, for example, if the bug bounty is one hundred thousand dollars, and actually you were asking for questions. This is an opinion. That's totally an opinion. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, no, I just meant like thing, like hands. I, but, yeah. I do have a hand up. So, okay. uh, if a researcher has put like a hundred thousand dollars of his time, like what he would get paid at a university, for example, like uh, to finding this bug, and then uh, the bug bounty is only fifty thousand, then you know he really doesn't have an incentive. It's like, oh, he can't cover his living costs. He's put that incentive. He's put that money in. Uh, so what you would need is is bug bounties, probably where the payouts are variable, where you say like, look. I found this thing. Uh, I'm not revealing it until you commit to pay me like that much. That's my. That's comment. called something else, isn't that <laughs> blackmail? <laughs> something. Okay, that's you're called up. an incentive system. You're up. You're up. <laughs> Extortion. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, he's really. You've been patient. All these answers imply that the bug bounty actually pays out and that the vendor actually wants to say that they have a bug in their software, which is not the case in the majority, well, not the majority, but in some of the larger vendors. So while I love the Ethereum Foundation, if somebody were to find a huge game-breaking exploit, it's up in the air whether or not the Ethereum Foundation is going to go, yeah, that's a bug. For example, Sony or even Bitfi on Twitter yeah, these things don't always work the way that... It's very opinion-y. And it sucks because it's a shame you don't get to answer that. But. I'm on the security team. We'll never do that. <laughs> nice. Okay, you're up. Oh. Yeah. That was not a question. By the way, when I say questions, I mean like whatever you want to say. Hands, basically. Uh, should we get answers on this? Yeah. Yeah, so I think... Fortunately, in our space, um, bug bounty programs have been pretty correct. Like, I've seen a lot of payouts, especially by the Ethereum Foundation. Um, but yeah, going forward, we might see the behavior that we see, like, with Bitfi Wallet or with Apple, Microsoft, whatever. Um, so yeah, pretty much, pretty much that. And regarding whether uh, a bug bounty can change the behavior, um, everyone here is like calculating the hours of a researcher's time, but there is also another aspect. Um, projects working using these tools and using um, basically everything from this space can discover bugs uh, by themselves. For example, um, one of the projects that's, that I worked on discovered a bug in the Solidity compiler, and we didn't have any issue with reporting that because it did actually didn't take any extra time. Um, so that's another aspect to look at. I mean, researchers are not the only entities who are discovering bugs in these projects. People who use these projects also are discovering bugs in them. So yeah. 
Do I get to say my answer now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dial this back a little bit. So for the um, do they change behavior thing, I don't think that any black hat out there would be convinced that, oh, they're going to give me a couple hundred thousand dollars to, like, yeah. give up my entire life of crime and <laughs> completely change the moral compass that I have in my head and not hack the thing because, I, you know, I, I don't think that's funny and I don't want to do it. Um, so they're a method of rewarding people to create a more active contribution network and a more active just group of collaborators. But ultimately, the bad people that are out there that want to get you aren't going to be changed one iota. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> touchy, touchy subject. One iota uh, by the existence of a bounty. Um, on the other hand, sparse first dense, like I hate when I see people giving out bounties and they're just streaming them out at like $100 or $1,000 a pop. If you're paying out bounties just left and right, you have an engineering problem and you need to pay someone to go fix the underlying security issue instead of outsource all ownership of that to a bunch of volunteers. Um, so like the, the line of thinking in the blockchain community that, oh, because I, have a because I have a bounty program, I'm safe, is a little bit misguided. Like, sure, it can be part of a solution, but there's a lot of things that need to go into making a project safe that aren't a bounty. And a really good indicator that you've done one too soon or that it's not providing the output that you want is that you're paying out too often and at too low a price. It should be a high number. It should be infrequent. That's when you're doing it well. Do you have a, do you have a way in on that? Uh, I would need a microphone. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I completely agree that, you know, uh, Bounties are only maybe even marginally effective if you actually have sparse bugs, if you have like serious bugs where uh, someone actually has to dive in and find them. Like if you have tons and tons of issues in your code base, it's not something that a bounty is going to solve. Uh, but at the same time, uh, of course, it's not going to flip the people who are chasing that huge bag, like the $100 million that they would get if they exploit some bug in the wild. Uh, but the goal is like, uh, and it's maybe a bit unfair because it creates a race, uh, but the, the goal is to like overwhelm those people with honest contributors. Uh, even though only one of those guys gets paid, it may actually be able to leverage uh, more effort into finding those kinds of bugs than uh, someone who's exploiting them, uh, the system maliciously. Okay, hands. Oh, now there's some. There's some over there. Is there anything Ace. that is other than bounties? Yeah, we can also... <laughs> anything other than bounties? All the hands went down. Oh, there's one back there. Oh. Kind of related to bounties, but not about bounties. It's just that this idea that um, people are just kind of hanging out and looking for bugs to like just solve, and they've got nothing better to do, is kind of untrue. And related to that is the pipeline of how are we making sure that more people are acquiring these skills and solving these problems within the community. So I think that, yeah, when it comes to the bug bounties, it's a nice idea, but it's not wholly realistic that people need to make a living. And people need, to, like, they've got other things in life that they care about. They need to come up with, um, yeah, how are they going to pay their rent and stuff. And they're not like, okay, I'll just spend a few months looking for this big problem because I got time to spare. A lot of people don't have that luxury in this world. And so um, how do we help people make a living? And then also how do we help them like, per, like become part of this pipeline and ha share this knowledge? You're up. Okay. Come on. <laughs> You're out. Really well stated, though. Nice. A well stated opinion followed by a question. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, the question is like whether it actually exists that people are doing like just taking a few months to look for bugs, I think that's very, very unlikely. Uh, but even the really, really like awesome payoff bugs? But they don't know that they exist. They don't know that those bugs exist. It's, it's, it's a variable payout at the yeah. end of it. You might not get any money. Yeah. You can't live for six months with like the 50% yeah. chance that I'll make rent. So it's, it's almost definitely... Yeah. It's almost definitely people who are already working on the thing. Like, people who are like, how do I extend this or trying to understand how it works? People who already have that deep arcane knowledge and are getting paid to do it. Yeah. So who are, to publish it anyway. Yeah. And now they get a bonus when they're done. Well, yes. Right. Do, do you want a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so you can look at like the Microsoft bug bounties. They have the mitigation bounties that are a hundred and uh, uh, like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And every single team that has won those have, have been people that weren't seeking to find the bounty, but that just stumbled into something. And then they're like, oh, I guess I'll get paid too. Um, and the vast majority of them have been academic teams that were going to do research and like had publications. Uh, same thing, the Facebook Internet Defense Prize. Uh, and then you've got the Apple bug bounty, which is the one for like uh, uh, boot security bypass bugs, like to you know get information off people's phones and they're turned off. And uh, no one has claimed it. <laughs> because even though you set out this enormous prize, what you were saying that like, okay, it's going to take about a 12 month dedicated engineering effort with about a team of four people, and then we'll get a $200,000 prize out of it. There's no amount of money that you can offer that makes that make sense. Um, so uh, no one has claimed that bug bounty. That is a poorly engineered bounty. All right. Yes, sir. Question. Wait, there's one. I think you didn't weigh in yet. You didn't answer that, did you? Yeah. Um, well, I just, I don't know, I, just mirroring their opinions on this. Uh, people think that, if, if people think that they're going to be uh, researchers out there looking for bugs in your project just because you have a bounty, well, you're sadly mistaken because for the majority of ICO projects out there, for example, um, they have a lot, large community, but most of that community is probably either interested in staking, if that, and probably just uh, waiting to find a return on their tokens itself and they're not necessarily coming through the code to find bugs to help you out. And if they are, they're probably more closely uh, uh, acquainted with your project through maybe the, through the developers. Um, and even then, it's still iffy. Uh, I, I really just having a uh, bug bounty pro uh, project does not ever at all imply people are ever going to find these bounties or that you're going to pay out. Just Okay, la last point, more questions. But what do you want to say? Nobody oh. says I do bug bounties for a living. Right, well, what I was going to say is no, students do. Yeah. That's, that's the best <laughs> audience students for bug bounty do. stuff because $500 is a meaningful amount of money to a 20-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you train up a whole bunch of like, next generation of people? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, how do you train up a new generation of people is sometimes these bug bounties are great as learning exercises for people that don't know anything yet. So you're not going to get the expert, but you'll get the beginners. Okay. Yeah. Question, question. They need more than a bug bounty program to do that. <laughs> All right, hands. Changing tack completely. Yeah. Are zero knowledge proofs and particularly ZK snarks overhyped? That is a, is that a leading question? I, th I think it's a fine question. Are they overhyped? Okay, we just leave it. Are they overhyped? <laughs> okay. As so, you look at this audience of I have to walk out of here and actually walk home without being murdered. Um, <laughs> however, uh, I would say to an extent, yes, but 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 uh, cryptography goes through hype cycles. Uh, and does it? It does. Blockchain is at is at the top of hype right now. Um, ZK snarks are sort of you know, at the top of a long coasting along with this as well. Um, right now, there's probably not that many people in this room, maybe on two hands, if that, that could probably walk anybody through the math of the ZK snark right now. Uh, with that said, it might be a little overhyped and we have round tables to help curtail this so people can learn how to apply them properly and when to know when they can apply them. Um, in some cases, I've seen some examples where they may have been able to use more traditional cryptographic means of just regular proof of knowledge than an actual ZK snark, which is way more complex. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's rel just a little, just okay. a little. Please how don't kill me. Go, go this way. What do you think? Is it overhyped? <laughs> uh, so I, I personally don't think that they're overhyped. Like, sure, they're 
complex, but there are a lot of things that are complex and still useful. Like you don't actually have to understand how something works to understand its value. Like what academics do a lot of the time is just create sort of black boxes. Like they'll design like, oh, here are the, the, here are the, the, the properties that this protocol has to fulfill. And then you can sort of plug that into some other system and you have an instantiation. And then in practice, you have probably some library that's well vetted and nobody really knows how it works except for some like people with deep arcane knowledge. And, uh, but everybody uses it and it's actually effective. Um, the, the only questions that are still open are really just, uh, can you make them efficient enough? Can you do things like, I don't know, aggregation well enough? Can you uh, merge proofs? Uh, can we find useful applications? And those are the questions that are still a bit shaky, but I, yeah, probably will get better. I don't know how much better. Right. So what are we doing to make sure that the people who are able to solve those problems are acutely aware of how those problems need to actually be implemented, or the solutions need to be implemented. So the feedback loop of the people who are able, yeah, to basically, in academia or wherever, to do the research and to solve the difficult problems. Do they know what we need? How are we making sure that we're talking about this? That's what I want to know. I think that's what we need to do. And then we won't be overhyped. Uh -huh. So I don't think they're overhyped. Um, so I'm not a cryptographer myself. There are people on my team that are, and I've uh, you know, spoken to them quite a bit about use cases for this kind of stuff. And I see that we're just at the beginning of it. I think that there are more complex assertions that you can make with zero knowledge proofs that people haven't tried to do yet. Uh, so like there might be information that a company has that they don't want to disclose, but like, okay, so I have a client list. I would like to prove to you that I have such and such people as clients or, or some number of them or some value uh, but I can't do that right now without just telling you who they are. So trying to find opportunities like that that fit into real use cases for either businesses or maybe even national security, uh, where like governments all over the world accumulate a vast amount of classified information. If there are a way to expose that to the public in a way that wouldn't endanger the actual integrity of the data through zero knowledge proofs, that would be cool. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of opportunities to explore those different use cases in the next few years now that the underlying cryptography has become efficient enough that we can start to try it. Um, so I don't think cool. we're overhyped. Hat. Uh, you already answered. Oh, I, I, can I just add? New follow-up. Oh. One. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so I think before we can, and this is my, you say they're not, hy they're not hyped. I say they're maybe just a little bit. I think there's a compromise here, and it is ZK snarks and zero knowledge proofs need to be standardized. And there is some standardization going on right now that everyone in this room should at least attempt to try to participate in. It's that important that this happens. Um, Zcash has been a major helper in that. I think the first one, the first standardization workshop was at Zcon. He's, he's not at Zcash oh, at all. Oh, I, oh, that guy left. Whoops. There was one in Boston. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it was at Zcon Zero. No, 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 before it. Before? Oh, yeah, that's right. It was the. And then after that was the FHE one, I think, right? Or was it after? I don't know. Yeah, there were some standardization but, workshops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a standardization workshop, but everyone in this room who's affiliated and or working on zero knowledge proofs and things like this should participate in that. And before we can really, I think, make a fair as assumption that it is hyped, that it is hyped enough or underhyped or overhyped, we need tools that allow us to easily understand when these problems can be applied. I don't think there's enough tools like that out there. LibSnark, for example, is helping. Um, but I'm really excited to see what in the next five years uh, comes out of ZK Snarks and ZK Starks for that matter. Okay, hands. I, do you still have your, no? Okay, your, your hand was up for a while. Um, I'm gonna ha add an opinion here. Um, given how hyped blockchain is, I don't think Snarks are overhyped because there's so many privacy problems that blockchains have that we will need zero knowledge proofs for. On the other hand, I do agree though, and I think um, you with the orange cow or wolf or whatever, um, made, a, made a bit of a face when you were saying, oh, you can do a membership proof with a zero knowledge proof. Um, membership proofs are not necessarily, you don't need a zero knowledge proof to do a membership proof. And I, I think- I didn't say maybe, point proof, but I just said there are people who yeah. have used the, okay, yeah. So anyway, but the, the membership proof is one thing that you can use, in a, use a zero knowledge proof for, I think, 
zero knowledge proofs are hype right now because maybe Vitalik wrote a blog post and so the entire blockchain world knows about it. There are many other cryptographic tools where not familiar enough yet with, such as multi-party computation and things that me not being a cryptographer, I don't know well enough either. But I do think that zero knowledge proofs are not overhyped. Everything else is not hyped enough. You're up. Dan. <laughs> nice to have you up here twice. Yes. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> do you guys want to answer this? I guess there was no the, real... The question was, was just, just that, like there are other... Crypto Do we just ask about it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. hands, hands, yeah, hands, hands. He, his hands been up for a while. No? Yes? Um, half opinion, half question. Like, is the need for like bounties in crypto completely overblown simply by the fact of specu like the speculation making it actually worth? trying to game the system in any way instead of spending more resources on like doing security work for real security researchers shouldn't they prioritize their time like fixing libssl and all these kind of thing, bugs that actually protect real important data and not just people's virtual currency i think that's actually still question ish plus you went back to bounties so shall we just do it <laughs> yeah, we're, we're back on bounties, guys. <laughs> back on bounties. All right. Uh, yeah, we can't shake it. Keep uh, going. Uh, was it not? Well, I mean, in the sense that, like, all, some of those more important problems don't have bounties for them. There's not funding for them because they have Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The, the, like, the, there's a lot of really important cryptographic work that happens in open source projects that aren't blockchain related. Is that what you're referring to, right? Yeah. Just like yeah. Actual there's not bound. Yeah. It's where the money's at. I mean, uh, like the, there's there's funding for solving so for bug bounties in this in the blockchain space because there's money there and because of speculation. But when it comes to like the the cryptographic protocols that like underpin like the internet and stuff like that like all these other things like there's not as much money to like figure out the security problems of those so i mean that's kind of unfortunate but they, so there's not bug bounties there i mean there's some but there's not money there it, it's usually third parties like the mozilla secure open source fund and open tech fund and all these other ones that are funding like security audits of these open source projects that are used that are not blockchain related I think to many in the industry, like the heart bleed um, was a bit of a wake up call because I'm, and don't quote me on these numbers, but uh, OpenSSL had like two maintainers um, and it was literally used by the entire world. Um, and at least now I think Google definitely and a few other companies that, well, their business is broken if SSL breaks, um, stepped up and are like helping. Um, I don't know how they're helping, but I think this. It is something that we were maybe not aware of enough that there are so many open source projects, sometimes decades old, that are, yeah, not getting enough attention and are running on every phone, every, in every project that you could think of. Yeah, I mean, mostly in, in parallel with that, I think it's it's the hype of blockchains has only increased funding for those bug bounties, but actually the necessity of other bug bounties is actually probably higher, even if you consider current hype and price levels. I mean, yeah, SSL, if there's huge bugs there, it takes down Google, it takes down like the whole freaking internet. Uh, that would be really bad. Uh, but like, even if blockchains were way less hypes, I think the, the sort of catastrophic Im implications of some of those bugs, like if you could just print money uh, secretly without anybody realizing it and slowly trickle it out, it doesn't matter if the price is one or 100. I mean, you're talking about a scale where you can just sort of deplete the entire market and you know, that's, that's a huge issue regardless of whether that market has a lot of depth or a little bit of depth. There. Um, uh, sure. Well, I'm oh, oh, trying. We have, a, we have a question. Oh, oh. Well, actually, I, I can make an opinion, right? Yeah. Right. So, oh, yeah, we have, yeah. A, we have so, a person who's going to jump in. Yeah, hey. so I, I have the opinion that uh, ZK Snarks and, and uh, Zero Knowledge Proofs are actually almost underhyped. So, and so this morning we had Aww. a round table. We had a round Not table. Them. Uh, we had a roundtable uh, with GDPR. Now, GDPR says that you have the right to be forgotten and you have to the right to control your data. 
Now, anything that is personal information falls under that regulation, and a personal piece of information is anything that can get referred back to your person, either in the data set that's stored or in any additional data. Now, the problem is there's almost nothing that can't be combined in a way to refer back to the, to, to the person, even if it's just a hash or anything. So we will end up with a situation in which we will have to think of security by initial design, where we put the fractions on the blockchain and on the storages that only prove that something has taken place the way that it was supposed to, whereas everything else needs to be somewhere else. And this can only be done by homomorphic encryption, ZK, SNARKs, STARKs, whatever, bulletproofs, and whatever comes up there. So this is as close to the magic wand that we can actually use, and I think the ZK SNARK or the zero knowledge proof as such is just as important as blockchain technology as a whole. That was amazing. And we are actually at time right on that comment. So I think... I agree. I think this <laughs> wraps up the park bench panel. Everyone wildly agrees. <laughs> I hope you guys liked this. Uh, we, this is the second time we've done this panel setup. It's kind of neat. Uh, again, thanks to everyone for coming out. And now there are drinks, and that's it. There's actually just <laughs> drinks and a chance to talk to people. Do we have anything else we want to say? Thank you very much for coming out. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Let's party.